Hi everybody, it's 9 o'clock and 9 o'clock is with me, Father Warner. We are at the start of a new week and we begin this week with everyone's favorite saint, Saint Anthony of Padua, who's more than just a patron of lost things. Now, the man who became known to the world as Saint Anthony of Padua was born Fernando Bulholm in Lisbon. Um, he was born in Portugal in the year 1195. And we know that his father served King Alfonso I as a knight. Now, when Fernando was just 15, he chose to join the Augustinian monks at um, St. Vincent, which was just outside the city. Now, two years after uh, him joining in St. Vincent, Fernando saw that he was being too distracted by frequent visitors from outside the monastery. So he then asked for a transfer and they moved him to the monastery of Santa Cruz, which really translates as Holy Cross, uh, which was in Portugal's capital. At that time, the capital was Coimbra. Now, for the next eight years, Fernando immersed himself in prayer and scripture, and he became an avid student of theology and also a very avid student of the fathers of the church. Now, most historians assume that it was during this time that he was also ordained to the priesthood. But this we know that after his ordination to the priesthood, he was named as guest master and he was responsible for the abbey's hospitality. It was in this capacity in the year 1219 that he came into contact with five Franciscan friars who settled in a small hermitage outside Coimbra. We, uh, the reports are a bit conflicting, but uh, they were on their way to Morocco to preach the gospel to the uh, Moors or the Muslims there. Fernando was strongly attracted to the simple evangelical lifestyle of the friars, whose order had been founded just 11 years uh, prior to this. So in February of the following year, um, news arrived that these five Franciscans who had traveled to Morocco had been martyred. They were the first to be killed in their, or martyred in their new uh, order. Now when the bodies of the first Franciscan martyrs went through the Portuguese city where he was stationed, Fernando began to reflect on the heroism of these men. He was inspired by their example and he longed for the same gift of martyrdom. Fernando eventually received permission to leave the abbey so that he could now join this new Franciscan order. When he was admitted, that's the time when he changed his name to Anthony. Anthony then traveled to Morocco to spread God's truth, but became extremely sick and he returned to Portugal to recover. The ship that they were in was, we are told, blown off course and the entire party um, arrived, instead of arriving back home in Lisbon, they arrived in Sicily, in Italy, from where they traveled to Tuscany. Now, Anthony was assigned to the hermitage of San Paolo after local friars, you know, considered his health because that's the reason why he left Morocco. So they gave him this small hermitage to recuperate, to recover. Now, as he recovered, St. Anthony spent his time in prayer. He spent his time studying. This is a very integral part of St. Anthony, which is downplayed. The fact that he was a great student of scripture and a great student of theology. Now, uh, we don't know when, but an undetermined amount of time later, we are told that Dominican friars came to visit the Franciscans. And um, this is that ever popular narrative. Uh, we are told that there was confusion over who would present the homily. I've read in some sections um, in some articles that it was the occasion was an ordination but there was some confusion now the Dominicans were known for their preaching so the Franciscans simply assumed that it would be they who would provide a homilist 
but the Dominicans assumed that the Franciscans would provide one. Now, it was the head of the Franciscan hermitage who finally went to Anthony and asked him to speak on whatever the Holy Spirit told him to speak of. Um, I think they were looking out for a cop-out solution. They must have said to themselves, well, we get this ordinary chap uh, who's the guest master out of the kitchen and uh, well, we can always say, uh, you know, uh, he was not one of the finest, but we just found one. But, but, the years of searching for Jesus in prayer, of reading sacred scripture and of serving him in poverty, in chastity and obedience had prepared Anthony to allow the spirit to use his talents. Um, you know, I, I want to say this, many years ago and um, I was watching the Oprah Winfrey show and she said there's no such thing as luck. She said there's hard work meeting opportunity and I thought, wow, hard work meeting opportunity. I wanted to add one more, grace, yeah, God's grace. Many people say you're lucky. I say, no, you're not lucky, you're blessed. Hard work. St. Anthony worked hard at his scriptures, at his. And then the opportunity came by, something that he didn't want but was given. And God's grace met the three. Anyway, so we're told that St. Anthony delivered an eloquent and a very moving homily. And it just impressed everybody in the room. Anthony's sermon was astounding to those who expected an unprepared speech and knew not the Spirit's power to give uh, these beautiful words to Anthony. That's why I said uh, opportunity, meeting hard work, meeting grace. Now, Anthony's sermon uh, created a very deep impact on those who heard him that day. Not only his rich voice and arresting manner, but the entire theme and the substance of his discourse and his moving eloquence really held the attention of his hearers. And I think this is what a good homilist does. Uh, many people often tell me, they say, oh, Father Warner, I'm sure you can just go to a mic and you can start preaching. I want to make a confession. I, till today, after 22 years of being a priest, I am terrified, ask my staff the night before um, tomorrow, I mean, uh, the night before Sunday, uh, I prepared my text and then I'll be walking up and down the terrace and I'll be running it through my head and wondering, is this good? Shall I knock this off? What should I do? And then, of course, it is grace. And I say this because I have gone to the pulpit with a fantastic homily, at least I thought it was fantastic. And boom, just like that, the Holy Spirit comes in and I as I say, God help everybody when I depart for my prepared text. But that's what God wants. And at the end of the homily, I will meet somebody who will say, that homily was for me. And I know in that moment that God decided that the one lost sheep had to hear his voice through me. So God simply took my homily and threw it into the dustbin. But that's what the Holy Spirit does. And that's what the Holy Spirit did to St. Anthony. You see, at that point, um, Anthony was also then commissioned by uh, a fellow Franciscan brother. His name was Gratian. He was the local minister to the provincial. And then he was appointed to preach now after this incident, the gospel, throughout the area of Lombardy. Lombardy is in, was in the north of Italy. Now, in this capacity, uh, St. Anthony came to the attention of the founder of the Order of the Franciscans and that's St. Francis of Assisi himself. In the year 1224, Francis entrusted his friar's pursuits of uh, studies to St. Anthony. It was literally, he said, this is your new rector. This is the one who will lead your seminary. Anthony will be the rector in charge of the studies of the Franciscans. Now, there's another very interesting um, anecdote linked to the life of St. Anthony. And this will also tell you why St. Anthony is often interceded to when things are lost. So Anthony had a book of Psalms that contained notes and comments to help him while, while he was teaching students. And in a time when the printing press was not yet invented, 
St. Anthony greatly valued it. This was also, some say it was a book, some say it was a breviary, whatever it may be, he greatly valued it. Now, we are told that a novice decided to leave the hermitage and he stole St. Anthony's valuable book. When St. Anthony discovered it was missing, yes, he prayed. He prayed that it would be found and returned to him. And we are told that the thief did return the book and in an extra step returned to the order as well. And this book is said to be preserved in the Franciscan friary in Bologna in Italy uh, till today. And that is the reason why St. Anthony is, um, is, is interceded to when things get lost. You know, I must share this incident with you. That's one year, once I said to myself, I'm just going to go straight to Jesus. I'm not going to say St. Anthony, which, which, if Jesus can do it for me, he can do it. And I remember I was about to travel to London and I needed that famous oyster card which I had. And I searched and searched and searched. I said, no, Jesus, you are going to help me. I don't want St. Anthony, I don't want anybody. And at one time I was desperate because I remember at the same time, that was the night I was leaving, we had um, the Archbishop of, um, who is in London, I, he's retired now, I can't get his name, and our Cardinal, and I was asked to organize a dinner in our parish hall for all of them. So the guests were about to come. Here was I trying to find my oyster card, getting ready for a flight uh, that night. And finally I said, okay, I give up St. Anthony, I said. Help me, please help me to find it. Guess what? I looked down, it was there. <laughs> so I now go to St. Anthony. I've been blessed to go. I just came back last month from Lisbon where I was uh, for the second time at the place where he was born at that, in that little small room. Um, and also very fortunate to be, go to Padua in uh, northern Italy, very close to Venice. Um, where I prayed at St. Anthony's tomb and where you will find that beautiful relic which I will talk about. Now, St. Anthony occasionally also taught at the universities of Montpellier and Toulouse in southern France, but he performed best in the role as a preacher and this is what many people don't know. Uh, St. Anthony was loved and respected by his Franciscan brothers. He was elected provincial of the friars in northern Italy in the year 1227. And during the next three years, he also served as an envoy to Pope Gregory IX. And he preached throughout Italy. He wrote sermons for Sunday, which were uh, notes to aid other preachers in preparing their own sermons. Now, on one occasion, after Anthony preached before uh, the Roman Curia, the Pope actually called him the Ark of the Testament because of his profound knowledge of the scriptures. Um, he later also commissioned him to produce a series of sermons for the church's feast days. So this is something that many of us don't know, that St. Anthony was a brilliant preacher. Now, in June of the year 1230, Pope Gregory IX released Anthony because Anthony made a request to the Pope. He said, release from me for my duties as provincial so that I can devote my energies exclusively to preaching. And I cannot tell you I feel the same right now. I, I, I keep asking the Cardinal in Bombay, I need to study the scriptures more. Release me from being parish priest. I want to go to a little part of Goa. But you know, you have to propose and then allow God to use you. But in preparing for this text, I felt so much like what St. Anthony is feeling. I know I'm good at what I do, but I know I feel the Lord still wants me to devote my life to scripture study. And I can tell you, I know so little. I have so much more to read and to learn. And I'm very afraid because as some of you know, my Bell's palsy really troubles me. And um, my eyesight has been giving me a lot of difficulty. Um, I get um, spasms in my cheek, etc. So keep me in prayer. But I, I like to share from time to time some of my thoughts with you. Now, let's come back to St. Anthony. So from that time on, after he was released by Pope Gregory, um, Anthony resided in Padua. And that's uh, what also made him so famous and made Padua so famous. 
you know, Padua was a city whose people had become very dear to St. Anthony when, because he had preached also to them earlier. His teachings were simple. So simple was his teachings of the Catholic faith that they say the most unlettered and the most innocent of people could understand his message. And that's how the good news should be, not in flowery language and, you know, we throw in several levels. Uh, lines and sentences of Latin and Greek. I know I sometimes give you the Greek words more for clarification. But it's not about being verbose and it's not about being, um, you know, uh, about showing off your knowledge. It's often showing off the love of God in simple words and how God loves us. So it is for this reason that St. Anthony was also declared a doctor of the church by Pope Pius XII in 19. 46. Now, um, once when St. Anthony, and this is one of the narratives um, that we can speak of, there's one also of St. Anthony and the donkey, and I recommend you hear it, uh, read it. Several um, years ago when we had an exhibition to commemorate the golden jubilee of the National Eucharistic Congress, a person from Goa, Carlos by name, loaned us a beautiful panel of St. Anthony and the Donkey. It became uh, the, 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 the main piece uh, because we did it on the Eucharist and this was a beautiful, beautiful Indo-Portuguese piece um, that he loaned us for display. So there are several uh, narratives about the miracles that St. Anthony worked but this one about St. Anthony is very famous that once when St. Anthony of Padua, <clears throat> he was attempting to preach the true gospel of the Catholic Church to heretics they would not listen to him. So he went out and he preached his message to the fish. And when the critics saw the fish uh, begin to gather, they realized they should also listen to what St. Anthony had to say. St. Anthony was just 35 years old when he died. 35 years old when he died. And, he, and here's the thing, he was made saint. That process is called canonization, when you're made a saint. He was made a saint in less than one year by Pope Gregory the Ninth. Now, according to one book by uh, Father Ubaldus the Riti, uh, he wrote a book called The Life of St. Anthony of Padua. Uh, there is also some evidence that some in the church opposed the quick canonization of St. Anthony, uh, particularly a very influential cardinal because, uh, and because of this cardinal's objection, Pope Gregory the Ninth hesitated but soon the cardinal had a dream that he and the pope were at the dedication of a church but they had no relic for the altar and nearby was a casket containing the remains of Anthony from which they extracted a relic and placed it on the altar. Now following this dream the cardinal encouraged the pope to canonize Anthony as soon as possible. The canonization, the quickest in history within one year took place on May the 30th 1232 and Pope Gregory the Ninth said that the world should not be deprived of venerating such a holy man who was the source of many many proven miracles. Such a virtuous life cannot be hidden and then they say upon exhumation some 336 years after his death his body was found to be corrupted. Listen to this it was corrupted yet his tongue was totally incorrupt. And you can see it in Padua when you go there. So perfect were the teachings uh, that had been formed um, upon that beautiful tongue of his. St. Anthony is venerated all over the world as the patron saint of, as I said earlier, of lost articles and is credited with many miracles involving lost people, lost things and even lost spiritual goods. Now, St. Anthony truly is a favorite of the Catholic world not merely of the Catholic Church, but of the world. St. Anthony of Padua has more cities and places named after him than any other saint. I read an article that said there are 68 cities. San Anton uh, uh, is what you, or you, uh, cities named after him, 68. Now, I'm going to give you the breakup. They say there are 44 in Latin America, 15 in the United States, 4 in Canada, 4 in the Philippines and 1 in Spain. There are four capes, 
three bays, two reefs, and two peaks also named after St. Anthony. And even more numerous have been, uh, until quite recently, the statues of St. Anthony in churches, where he is depicted holding the Christ child um, on the book of the scriptures, and also depicted in some uh, holding a lily or a flaming torch. And in one case, uh, in Seoli, um, in Goa, he is even holding a serpent. I want you to Google that one, the Seoli church in Goa. It's a beautiful narrative of two Portuguese sailors who were almost drowned at sea and then they decided they wanted to um, dedicate a church of their own funds. And they began the work, but there was a horrible serpent, a cobra, that uh, they say had uh, proportions of a dragon that kept um, attacking people and people died. And finally, the friars uh, installed a statue of um, St. Anthony and they prayed fervently because they were about to abandon the church project. And the next morning they woke up and on a rope from St. Anthony's hand um, was hanging this serpent. Go to Seoli Church and you'll see this uh, serpent in silver on the main altar. So while St. Anthony is most famous for being the patron saint of lost things, as I said, he is the saint of amputees of animals, he's the patron saint of the, of the country of Brazil, he's the patron saint of elderly people, he's the patron saint of horses, of oppressed people, of poor people, of pregnant women, of shipwrecks and many, many, many more. That's how popular he is. He's one of the most popular Catholic saints. Saint Anthony is well known and well loved. I know it's a great uh, saint, uh, but the last thing I want to say. There are some silly superstitions also linked to St. Anthony. I once went to a home and there on the altar was St. Anthony tied with a rope. Now, you know, there are some people who believe that we won't release you with that rope till you have granted us our wishes. Don't twist the hand of St. Anthony or of God, yeah? Surrender to him. Intercede through his, to Jesus, uh, but don't twist anybody's arm. Happy feast, everybody. I know this is a long teaching. I've had to condense so much that I would have loved to say about St. Anthony, uh, but may his life fill you with great joy. To all the Antons, we have one in our parish, uh, our table boy who cares for us, uh, working here at St. Stephen's for 17 years, he is Anton, and I pray for him, all the other Antons, the Anthonys I know, uh, Tony D'Souza, who was once the chairman of the Citizen Bank, and. Tony from uh, Malad East, who's now in America, getting married this year. I'm sure they're missing. Then there's Tony and Pam, uh, also for Maudlem. There are so many Tonys I know. I'm sure the Tonys I haven't mentioned right now are, are going to take up crutches with me. Have a nice day, everybody. Don't forget to like this video. Share it with your friends. It's got some great information about St. Anthony. Tell them you need to listen to this homily because it tells you so much more about the great life of the saint. I'll see you tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Remember, always 9 o'clock is with me, Father Warner. Bye for now. Bye from a lovely rainy day here at St. Stephen's.